Hey, today I'm interviewing John Pullen, self-published author of 48 books in fiction and non-fiction combined. He's the most prolific writer I know, so I wanted to get a secret and share it with you. Let's get to the interview. So John, I have to ask, have you always wanted to be a writer? I suppose from about the age of about 11. In school, we had a very good English teacher, and uh, Mr. Cleary, I think his name was. And for homework over the weekend, he used to give us a creative writing thing. And that basically meant write a creative story about whatever you want. And I used to enjoy it so much. I came back every Monday morning with at least 20 pages in my exercise book written. Oh, really? And the average for the rest of the class was about one and a half. So I, d I used to get excellent, excellent, and he always said to me, he said, go and do your A-levels and all the rest of it, and then go to university and do English. And so I didn't, and I did photography, film and TV instead, but uh, that's another story. So yeah, I started um, writing, I enjoying creative writing at say let's say 10 11 12 years of age okay and when did you publish your first book um it would have been self-publishing and it would have been around about 2009 maybe something like that but remember i did 25 years or more as a scriptwriter and director in the film business uh, non-fiction films and did your career in, you know, film and documentaries, did it help with the writing after? Oh, it's all practice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're a scriptwriter, journalist, uh, fantasy writer, whatever. Uh, you need to write. I, I get uh, people who ask me about their children quite often and sort of say, you know, my Johnny, my Susan wants to be a writer. And I say, great, what have they, what have they written? Nothing. I said, why? Well, no one's paid them to write. And you think, they're not writers. Writers write, yeah? Exactly. And did you always want to self-publish? No, I didn't even know what that was when I started off. Because, you know, let's face it, it's not exactly uh, as long a history as traditional publishing, mm -hmm. by any means. Um, no, um, when I started writing, basically what happened... Uh, I decided to leave the movie business. Uh, I'd been running companies, uh, production companies for a while, and I decided, yeah, I'm going to go back to books. Books uh, are going to be easier. They're not as expensive to produce in your time and involving actors. So I thought, yeah, I, I, I want to go back and do writing books. So when I went back and sort of looked at uh, writing my books again, I thought, OK, the only thing I can do is uh, traditional publishing. And to do that, we need agents, don't we? Yeah. So um, I wrote three chapters, as the artist and uh, writer's year book tells you to do. And in those days, you actually sent it through the post. Um, you know, emails uh, were not really uh, requested in those mm -hmm. days. And um, I, so I sent them off and I, I followed everything the writer's book said. And um, I got my first uh, rejections, uh, you know, the standard one, I'm yeah. sure. Every writer has uh, got a collection of. And I did get quite a few over that year. But then I discovered um, Create Space. Uh, which, of course, I think Amazon now... Yeah, it's uh, now KDP, it. yeah. Yeah. So um, I discovered that, and it was very difficult in those days when you were starting off the technology. I'm not a born technical person. Um, I, I prefer writing to any other part of the uh, process. But I got through OK, and I got my first Kindle uh, book out, and, um, yeah, things got easier. Create Space improved enormously uh, in their production. That made it much easier for people like me. And um, I could then just concentrate on the writing full time. What is easier for you to write? Is it non-fiction or is it fiction? Fiction takes longer. I'm not going to say one is easier than the other. Because if you're in the zone on any subject as a writer. I still call myself under my website John Pullen Writer. I don't put author. 
uh, because I had all those years as a scriptwriter and I'd written other bits for papers and other things. So I, I use writer as a more generic term. And therefore, when it comes to fiction and non-fiction, um, I just write what I feel like, what interests me. So uh, recently, I've just had a new series I've been writing over the last year or so on amazing facts and for curious people and minds and stuff like that. Uh, but my next one, uh, after writing a few of those, uh, I think, OK, my brain needs some more exercise in another direction. So I've got my adult series of, um, the third series of uh, novels is an adults only one, technically. And it needs a third book written. So I've waited a couple of years and I think that's going to be my next one will be a novel. So which do I prefer out of the two? Whichever I'm feeling like at the time. Okay, and so the first book that you queried, uh, was it fiction or non-fiction? Uh, the first one that was published was uh, fiction, and it was the first of, it was Dragon's Claw, Knights of Zardonia, and I, I had made a number of attempts at writing in the previous ten years, because this was a slow process of saying, eventually I'm going to have to you know, move a film company away and I'm going to write, but it's a long process, mainly going through my mind in order to uh, get enough courage to go from one to the other. So uh, I, in, during that period, I wrote about 70 pages of one book, which has never been published. Uh, and I did about 35 pages of a different sort of novel, and uh, which obviously has never uh, gone further than that. But when it came to... Um, Dragon's Claw it was one I had well I don't I don't plan a book as as you know I we've had this conversation before I think we're both uh, yeah you're a panzer exactly like yeah so uh, I didn't but I had an idea and that really comes down to um, how I write if uh, shall I go into that you know on, mm. and what it was there, I use music when I'm writing and basically I if this is this is basically fiction we're talking about now I look at the scene in my mind's eye and I hear the characters what they're doing what they're saying and I just um, observe it and write it down I describe what's in my head at that time I don't plan the book because in my case if I did that I would be bored and mm. it would be a problem. The fact is that I don't know what's going to happen on the next page because it then makes it exciting for me and it allows my mind to go off in other directions. It's still got to pull itself together. It still has to be a story with subplots and all the rest of it. But I find that does work okay in the way my mind works. And I suppose spending so much time in the film industry... I think visually, you know, people um, think audio or tactile or that's when, you know, mine, mine is vision, so I, I see it all in my head and music helps. In the case of, um, I used a track or a few tracks from Muse um, in those days, because I was into them uh, a lot and uh, they, about three or four tracks in my head, I could almost see a story in its very basic form of an invasion, a takeover, yeah. a person being ejected out of everything and finding. But as we've spoken in the past ourselves, um, we're both fans of Arthurian legend. Yeah, we are. And um, I wanted to do an adaptation again of Mallory's original Arthurian legend, but place it 150 years in the future. And uh, yeah, and that led to a series of six books that way. And um, what, what was the, the song that you preferred um, from Muse to write a book? Um, it was, well, there were a number of them. Um, yeah, but if you I, had to choose one. Oh, probably uh, Sidonia. Uh, yeah. That's why you I had I had the Z in there, yeah, because it just conjured up uh, a lot. Of, it was nothing to do with... 
the, the, the lyrics had nothing to do with what I was writing about, but I was listening to the music and I was putting my own lyrics in there and then that translated into a, a narrative for the book. So yeah. I'd be playing it back and forth. That's just incredible. And it sounds like you, well, not sounds like, because I know for a fact that you wrote a ton of book. 46. 46? Mm. So That's far. just incredible. So um, for the people watching this interview, what is your secret for being so prolific? Like a lot of things in life, um, if we do it enough, it becomes a habit. Now that can be good or bad. And for writers, and I think I could probably, because uh, we know each other from the past, um, it can become an addiction, writing. Yeah, true. Which is good because it's not drugs, alcohol, or any other addiction. <laughs> exactly. It's a very positive thing. And that's, that's a great way to have a habit mm -hmm. and an addiction. So yes, I write seven days a week, but um, I don't automatically, like a lot of writers will say, right, well, I'm going to write at uh, eight o'clock in the morning until half past 12, then I'm going to... Uh, I don't work that way. Basically, I'm a morning person, so I'm up early and I'll go through my emails overnight and things like that. By nine o'clock, I'm out. I don't work at home. Uh, I work in cafes and uh, I belong to a lot of art galleries and things. So I, I go along there and I'll write in their coffee bars and members bars uh, and restaurants. And then I'll have a half an hour walk around the gallery to clear my mind. And then maybe by or I'll go locally to certain places for coffee shops and um I'll then come back and then I may go out again in the afternoon for another couple of hours or I may just do other stuff. Um, so on weekends, uh, I play tennis every weekend, but I go down towards the club uh, a couple of hours early every uh, Saturday and I go to a Costa coffee shop and I do another hour and a half, two hours writing. So I use opportunities to fit in with my social life as well. So, but yeah, the bottom line is seven days a week. Okay, but when you started back in 2009? Uh, 2009, 2009, something, like, something like that, yeah. You didn't have that lifestyle. So can, can you remember how yes. you started writing oh, yeah. back in the day? Dragon's Claw, the first novel, right? Uh, I had probably more than any other book. I had some ideas of where I was going to go in chunks but no detail so I decided I would take because I was still doing some movies at that time but I decided I was going to take three months out and just write at least eight hours a day or more I was just going to just test myself out I had no idea because uh, this all you know writing a script is, is kind of different uh, I had deadlines and what have you so I gave myself a deadline. I still give myself deadlines. You know, I'd probably be better off with a traditional publisher because the deadlines would probably be better from them than me. <laughs> you know, so, um, so yeah, I decided that was it. I was going to write. And in those days, I wrote the whole thing longhand and then transferred to a laptop as I went along. Um, I don't do that so often now. Um, go straight to the laptop. But to give you an idea of how much effort I did put into it. Um, during that period, uh, I used to do a lot of sailing, large yachts, uh, what have you, and we were, uh, a group of us were going away for about three or four days down to the Solent in the south coast. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was up, it was lucky it was the summer, I was up, we'd be in a marina, and I'd get up about six in the morning, the sun would be coming up, and I'd sit out on the large yacht, and I'd just be writing. Yeah, uh, the book. So I wrote everywhere, you know, um, whole thing. And uh, I actually got a first draft out in 10 weeks, um, which was about 62,000 words, something like that. And uh, obviously then it took a lot of time then, you know, as we all know, we hate editing, all of us. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that it came out eventually. That's they got quicker after that. <laughs> as you get more used to it, don't you? Yeah. yeah, true, true that. 
Um, and I noticed that you write both fiction and nonfiction under your own name. Yeah. Um, but have you ever considered having a pen name? The only... I considered it, but I wasn't sure the reason I was considering it. The thing was, I originally... I made some movies um, towards the end of that part of my career under my own... I, I, I financed them as well, so I, earned, I could earn the royalties from them. And I felt then that I needed my own name uh, to go there as John Pullen Productions. And um, to have another name I thought would complicate things because I needed to have a brand and just starting off that way, I wanted to keep things simple. And when I went into book writing, the same thing. I thought, well, I've got a bit of a brand um, through my movies because distributors were buying them, and they still do. And um, therefore, Amazon uh, or Google uh, were picking up from, not me uh, as an individual, but they were picking up from my distributors my name. So I was slowly moving up the um, Google rate rankings. So I thought, well, if I start writing books now, I'd be silly to change everything. So I, the only thing I did then was set up a more uh, solid brand, which is John Pullen Writer. And now if that goes into Google, it comes up number one, page one, as long as the writer's there. Um, so um, that is the reason. Uh, it's purely to keep the brand. The one disadvantage I think I might have, and I don't know, I don't know whether you've had experience of any of this, uh, but because I write such an eclectic range of books, you know, you see a lot of authors are known for one particular type of book, fantasy, yeah, and, uh, but mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to do that. You see authors often doing one particular type, crime novels or romance, whatever, and they might do some allied non-fiction books attached to that sort of thing, you know, but um, no, I, um, mine's too eclectic, so I think, keep it John Pullen writer, um, but I think, yeah, if I was known as, you know, a different name for a particular thing, which I know authors do, you know, they have maybe their science fiction as one and then they might do crime, totally different thing, and they have a different name. And I think J.K. Rowling did that with her um, adult crime one, yeah, didn't she? Did. she? Yeah, she did. So, um, you know, it's, it's what people do. But I've chosen this at the moment. I've always told myself, this is a joke because I'm not going to do it. Um, but um, I've always told myself I will have a pen name if ever I write an erotic thriller or something like that <laughs> because I really don't really want to be known as a writer and I have no idea how to write one so it's never going to happen but I thought if ever I had to write something where I felt Ooh, about it uh, <laughs> and I've met quite a few authors at some of these events you know who just write it and uh, I, I met three of them once and they were all female and they were all in their 60s and they were just laughing about it and all the rest of what they did. You know, it's totally what you don't think it is. But no, uh, I know my limits. Uh, but I would definitely have to have a pen name if I ever do that. <laughs> but I don't intend to. So I'll stick with the name. I don't know whether it's a good or bad thing. I don't know whether you thought about that as well. Uh, well, I thought about having a pen name. But I I think I will, you know, keep my main brand as Estelle van der Veld. And when I start publishing fiction I will use my middle name uh, which is which is um, René mm -hmm. so I'm gonna put like Esther Estelle R. van der Velde just to keep it yeah. separate for Amazon but not too separate so people can still recognize me yeah and your own social media I take it then you yeah, make the, it clear to your same. yeah it so uh, it's yeah. too much work yeah it's too much work yeah I, I bet um, so, what do you do when you want to promote a new title? Um, so, for example, you have um, you have released four books in a series of non-fiction, which is oh my god. Yeah, uh, uh, the fourth, fifth one is uh, due in a few weeks. But wh what do you do to promote those titles? At the moment, very little. My 
biggest drawback is that I write and I kind of ignore. And, you know, it's, it's, we all like to be multimillionaires and I would really like some of my fiction to be movies. Obviously, with my background, uh, I actually produced... I For the first series uh, of uh, The Nice of Zardonia, I even produced a list of toys that could be made to go with a movie mm -hmm. and computer games. Um, I didn't... Yeah, you know, I just designed the outline of them. I'm you know, not a, a techie at all. Uh, but using social media, yes, I have a very good website that was done uh, for me. Uh, which I'm very grateful for and uh, I add the books to that with a description and they've all got a uh, action button uh, buy it on Amazon and that goes straight to the page yeah. so that's the main thing and I have my cards which I give out which uh, send it and I, I do a lot of sort of socializing with other people and I have people that push my stuff verbally uh, which all helps and um, I do use Twitter very rarely just to put a book out there, but um, it's good and bad, and I wouldn't pretend to know whether it was doing any good or doing any bad. I wouldn't know. Facebook, I do have a blog, and I now have uh, titles scheduled up until uh, next year. So um, I don't have to worry about doing it, those. I took time off my writing to write blogs and uh, schedule them so that goes out and the number of subscribers is going up and i i talk about it and uh you know i use feeding the curious mind as the uh, overall blog title for that and um that seems to help as well what i've started doing is that when the uh blog comes out on saturday morning uh usually maybe on the sunday evening or whatever i will put out the same blog on facebook because uh, it's always it's totally free to read my yeah, blogs yeah. and everything. So, so I do that, and that I'm getting um, noticed because I can then check the stats on my um, website, and you do see the little peaks go up when you do these things. So uh, you know it's, uh, but I'm not as I think you well know. Uh, you understand the business side of it because you're trained in. A lot of social media marketing and what yeah. have you. It doesn't I'm mean not. that I'm doing it well. It just no. means I know well. stuff, but I'm not doing it well for myself. This is just yeah, <laughs> but uh, you actually even know where to start. <laughs> you know, I I'm learning, uh, but I'm and the other thing, it may sound snobbish. I'm obviously uh, older than you, and I don't really have to because I spent my main career in the film business. Yeah. I don't have to live on my earnings as an author it helps having you know and it's lovely having um transfers of money from all around the world every month you know uh although it's only in english but you know i have had it probably from about 15 20 countries or more um you know with japan india you know south america and it's quite nice you only get a couple of yeah. uh, ones but it's, it's kind of nice where uh great britain and usa canada and australia are obviously main ones each month but um yeah it's uh it's nice but you don't have to, i don't feel pressurized that i have to earn money to do it as so many authors do and uh you know, in a way, I had very little overlap. I would always suggest uh, that if for a wannabe author, is obviously they write, but they keep their day job and try and fit in, you know, Pacific times or whatever, to get their writing habit going and to try and build up money to, uh, you know, be able to say goodbye to the day job and then get on with what they really want to do in life. Mm -hmm. But it's easier said than done. Yeah, and I sure. spent many years, you know, just doing another job. And talking about, you know, you, you said that your books were only available in English, but mm. did you ever consider translating them? Considered, yes, because a lot of my films were translated. And it's not easy to do it properly. Uh, I can speak about the film side of things because um, what I found was um, I needed a native speaker in London 
uh, although you could go ISDN lines, you know, across the world. But I went to the BBC World Service and uh, they have their journalists who are natives from other countries, so they speak the native language. Yeah. Uh, and they're also professional writers, being journalists. Perfect combination. Because I remember once we had one in, I think, Cantonese, and I was just sitting there in the control room thinking, I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> but I knew it was a journalist, a radio presenter, so the voice was good, uh, their knowledge was perfect, and yeah, they, they knew they could get the diction, the grammar, and make it sound as though this was made for a Chinese audience. And That's what it is. Speaking of audio, um, I also noticed that you don't have any audio book in your collections of books. Is it something that you are planning in the future? I have directed and produced over a hundred probably audio programs of all sorts in my first career. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what we started on, uh, was audio rather than video, film and all the rest of it. That moved on after two years after university. Mm. So um, I know it inside out. I've worked with voiceovers and actors and stuff, you know, for decades, you know, of all sorts, you know, from A-list celebs which I'm not going into uh, to lots of BBC and ITV presenters and things like that so I know how to direct uh, an audio show I, I you know what I have to, but no uh, at the moment with Audible I don't think financially it's a it's a great move not at the present time although Aud Audible is growing yes. fast and that may change of course Um, but what I have done in the past, um, I produced four CDs, um, a very specialist side on medicine, which I was qualified in from another story. And I was the voiceover for that. So I went to our my video uh, sort of editing studio, post-production studio, which wasn't mine, but I, uh, I used to work with. And they obviously had the sound booths and the proper yeah. channel thing. So it was all done professionally. It was done to broadcast standard, as all our films were had to be done to broadcast standard. So I produced those myself. So not only did I have my sort of 20 years of, uh, you know, being the director, listening to the professional voiceover, I've also had to do about um, quite a few hours worth, you know, which was, you know, you're looking at probably about four or five days to do a novel properly, uh, you know, with a professional voiceover, because you can't, you can't ask a voiceover to come in at nine o'clock in the morning, mm. start, go put them in the booth or her in the booth, and then let them out uh, for a break at 12 30 and then shove them back in for another three hours in the afternoon. They won't have a voice. It'd be strained. You can't do that. Uh, you normally work in an hour, a couple of hours maximum. So it's a long, drawn-out thing. And that's going to be my last question for this interview. Uh, but what's your your take on AI? With mm -hmm. the raise of the, chat GPT, for example, yeah. um, what's, what's your take on that? Would you use that um, for your audiobook? As regards to using for an audio book, you'll have to uh, tell me all about that. Um, obviously, AI is coming everywhere. So, and if you, uh, and I do know that there are these sort of voice over things for that. I don't know. I've, I've never heard it. Um, uh, for example, I think it's Google, Google Books, who, right. which actually um, allows authors to use AIs to narrate their audiobooks. In that case, then, I, I shall Apple, have a look. Apple Books is also doing that, I think. Right. Um, that doesn't surprise me, and it's something I shall look at, certainly, and I'll get back to you on that, because it sounds interesting. Um, generally, uh, I am never going to be hand on heart. I'm never going to be an author that's going to go into AI and say, write me a book about so-and-so, <laughs> and then off it goes. Uh, for the start of, I don't think they've made an AI which can think like me. I think they're far <laughs> too good. That they don't have my sort of weird, weird mind when it comes to fiction. So, uh, and I have a writing style. After all those books, I do have a writing style, I have a talking style. In fact, listening to me now is probably how I would write uh, an answer to your questions if I had to write it down. So, um, I don't, I, I think AI might help 
I suppose, yeah, I use Alexa now and again. I've just got an Alexa and um, it's on my phone. And a few times in the last couple of weeks, I've used it on location to check a fact. Now, I know it's not perfect and I get it wrong. So what I did do then is I checked it later on a book thing after I'd put it in and they were all correct. So I'll let it, you know, I'll use it as a tool. And at the moment, it's a very limited tool, but goodness knows what it's going to be in 10 years' time or even 10 months. Well, thank you for your answers, uh, John. It was really a pleasure to have you on my channel. Oh, thank you. I, I enjoy your channel, actually. I, I've subscribed to it for years. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, thank you. Uh, thank and, you very um, much. Good luck for the release of your next book. And good luck with your books. Don't forget to check out John's books and his blog, Feeding the Curious Mind. The links are, of course, in the description. I will see you next week for another video. Bye!